Pod Champions, and welcome back. Mr. Chambers here, coming to read another two chapters from Powerless by Matthew Cody. Today we are in chapters 18 and 20, and after today's video, we'll have three more videos. So we're coming to the conclusion of the story. What I would like for you to do, just like I've had for the past couple videos, is I'd like for you to watch the video, listen to me read, and draw a picture of one scene from what was read and write a one paragraph summary of what you heard in the story. With that being said, we're going to dive into today's chapter in Powerless by Matthew Cody, chapter 18. Chapter 18, Briarwood. They took the news that Eric might be the shroud about as well as Daniel had expected. Rohan's first reaction was to get very quiet. Daniel knew that he was turning the evidence over in his head, testing for himself whether Daniel's conclusion fit the facts. Rohan was quick to point out that photos could be altered. Heck, with a little time at the computer, he could make any one of the kids into the shroud. But Daniel thought Rohan would eventually agree that they should at least look for more evidence, even though he would urge caution along the way. Molly's reaction was just as predictable, if a tad more violent. First, she called Daniel a bad name, then she took a half-hearted swing at him, which he managed to duck. Daniel knew it was half-hearted because if Molly really wanted to hit him, he wouldn't even see it coming. As it was, he barely got out of the line of fire in time, despite the fact that he was waiting for it. Then Molly got quiet, which in many ways was worse. Daniel would take the hitting and cursing Molly over the quiet Molly any day. But you don't have any real proof, she said after a time. You have all these theories and Plunkett's word, but no proof. There's the photo, offered Daniel. Photos can be fixed, said Molly. Rohan just said so. Listen, said Daniel. I hope I'm wrong. I pray that I'm wrong. But you have to admit the Plunkett's theory makes a lot more sense than everything else we have been told. All that stuff about the rules and Johnny Noble. Do I even have to ask who first told you all of that? Molly was silent, but Rohan nodded. It was Eric, he said. Eric is older than all of you, said Daniel, and he's only a little younger than the other kids who have lost their powers. From a strategic standpoint, it makes sense. You go after them when they turn 13, before they get too powerful to stop. And just look at all the things Eric can do. He's as strong as Clay, he can fly like Michael could, and he's almost as fast as Molly. Why does he have all these powers when you all have, at most, one or two? And why does he wait at all? asked Molly. Why doesn't he come after us when we're little, like Rose? Daniel hadn't thought of that, but surprisingly, Rohan had the answer. Well, if what Daniel says is true, then maybe he wants the powers he steals to be strong. He waits just long enough for the powers to ripen, so to speak, but still acts before they become a real threat. Molly shot Rohan a look that spoke daggers. If, he said, throwing his hands up in the air, I said, if. Molly, I don't want to judge Eric guilty without more proof, but I also don't want to find ourselves unprepared if the worst happens, said Daniel. If it is Eric behind all of this, then it's because he is sick, and I want to try and help him if we can. Molly kicked at a pebble with her shoe and stared at the dirt. She looked for a moment like a very little girl. It reminded Daniel of how out of their depth they all were. Okay, she said quietly. What do you want to do? Well, first of all, you were right. We need more proof. If we're going to confront him, then we need more than just conspiracy theories and a blurry photo to back us up. We need to find those missing issues of Fantastic Futures, the ones featuring the Shroud. If Eric has those in his possession, that's pretty strong evidence that he's less than honest. Anyone up for a little breaking and entering? asked Rohan. The three of them stood outside Eric's window, trying to summon up courage that no one wanted to find. They were preparing to break into the house of one of their best friends. 
While they hesitated, a feral cat and her kitten skittered off under the house while a neighboring guard dog strained against its leash and barked a warning. Rohan pointed to a single beaten up car in the driveway. Looks like someone's home, he said. Eric's mom, said Molly. She works the night shift at Norma's Grill, so she'll probably still be asleep. Rohan gave Molly a worried look. It's all right, she said. She sleeps with earplugs in. They parked their bikes by the side of the house and went around the rear, careful to stay out of the reach of the barking dog. The yard reminded Daniel of lots of back in Philadelphia, mostly weeds and dirt. Wow, said Rohan. I never knew that Eric lived like this. They're not rich, but they are good people, Molly said. Even as she said the word, she grimaced. Daniel understood the struggle going on inside of her. If they found what they were looking for, that would mean that Eric wasn't such a good person after all. It would mean that he wasn't even the person they thought they knew. This morning, Daniel had taken Molly's entire world and turned it on its head. Here, she said, that's his window. It was just a few inches above the grass itself. He lives in the basement, Daniel asked. It's not as bad as it sounds, you'll see. Molly knelt down and pointed to a latch that dangled loose at the edge of the pane. The lock's busted, and Eric uses it to sneak out at night. Molly suddenly fell silent. I didn't mean it like that, she said quietly. That sounded terrible. We know, said Rohan. We all feel the same. Nodding, she pushed on the window's base, opening it inward. Molly stood up and dusted off her knees. After you, detective. Daniel eyed the window suspiciously, wishing that he'd thought to bring a flashlight. The sunshine would give him enough light to see by, but it was still pretty dark down there. Rohan, why don't you come with me? And Molly, you can keep an eye out. Eric said he was going to the fort, but just in case. Don't worry, just hurry up. Daniel scooted through the open window, followed by Rohan. Both kids fit with no problem. Daniel noticed that the earth around the window was worn smooth. Eric must have used this exit a lot. It wasn't a dark inside as Daniel had feared, and he took a moment to study the room. It was typical Eric, posters of superheroes and long boxes filled with comics everywhere. On the opposite wall, there was a map of Nobles Green and the surrounding countryside. One of those satellite photos taken from space. Daniel had seen the exact same kind in the observatory gift shop on the day that Eric had saved his life. The day that Eric had saved his life. There was that sick feeling again. The guilt knotting up Daniel's stomach like rope. Let's hurry, he said to Rohan. He didn't want to be here any longer than he had to. Rohan began looking through the comics while Daniel studied the map. As he looked closer, he saw tiny pinholes dotting the entire area. There was one pin for the Tangle Creek Bridge and quite a few more for spots here in Briarwood. Daniel suspected that Eric was marking all the places where he had actually done some good, all the places where he had been a hero. I don't think you should bother with the regular comic boxes, Rohan, at least not to start. You probably keep these comics hidden away, so we need to find a hiding place, like a locked box or a secret compartment or something. Sure! Let me just pull on the candelabra and reveal the hidden passage that leads to his lair, the Shroud Cave. Daniel looked at Rohan. Sorry, said Rohan. I'm just a little stressed out. It's okay. Let's just get this over with. They continued to search Eric's room, looking under the bed and behind bookshelves, but they found nothing. Despite the frustration, Daniel actually found his spirits starting to rise. Maybe Eric was innocent. Maybe this was all just the paranoia of a lonely old man who'd read way too many pulp novels. He was just about to call it quits when Rohan returned to the map on the wall. You look at this. Rowan asked. Yeah, looks like he's using it to record his adventures. But why is it breathing? What? What are you talking about? Daniel joined Rohan at the map and followed his friend's eyes. Sure enough, the map was moving ever so slightly. The surface undulated in a slow rhythm, like a sail in a light breeze. Hold on, said Daniel. 
He grabbed the edge of the map where it was taped to the wall, careful not to tear the paper. He peeled it back and exposed the air shaft behind the poster. A very slight draft issued forth, causing the edges of the map to ripple. The grating was missing and the open vent went back into the wall before disappearing into a larger central shaft. Resting in the cavity was a small stack of comics wrapped in plastic. Daniel gently removed them from their hiding place and showed them to Rohan, who nodded. Then Rohan pointed to the windows as Molly, silhouetted against the sunlight, peered through it. Daniel held the books up to the light and showed her the dusty covers. There was no mistaking the shadowy figure drawn on the front. She said nothing, but the look on her face was unmistakable. Daniel couldn't have hurt her more if he physically struck her. Molly, Daniel shouted, wait. But it was too late. Molly stepped away from the window and was gone. That was when he heard the footsteps upstairs. Daniel looked at Rohan, who was shaking his head. Oh man, he said, we are so grounded. At that moment, the door burst open and two policemen with flashlights appeared, brandishing pistols. Freeze, one of them yelled, hands in the air. As Daniel put his hands up, he saw a woman peeking over the shoulder of one of the officers. She was in her bathrobe and had a cell phone clutched to her chest. My goodness, she said. They're just kids. Yes, Daniel thought. I wonder if they have kid-sized handcuffs, because it looks like we are going to jail. Chapter 19, Grounded. Jail, thought Daniel. Jail would have been easy. At least in jail, they didn't give lectures. At least in jail, you don't have to see the disappointment on your parents' faces. Sure, you might stare at bars all day and your cellmate might be named Mad Dog, but all of that seemed like a pleasant alternative to Daniel. At least in jail, he could hide from all the trouble that he had caused. As it had turned out, Eric's mother wasn't really a deep sleeper after all. And when a helpful neighbor called to tell her that some people were trying to break into her basement, she woke up in a hurry. The police were quick to arrive and she even offered the handsome young deputies cookies before they hauled the two juvenile delinquents off in the squad car. As for Molly, she had disappeared and Daniel had a sinking suspicion as to where. Daniel's mother didn't say much to him when the officers brought him home. His little brush with the law being just one more thing to deal with. This made Daniel feel worse than any punishment would have had. With all the grief she was feeling right now, she shouldn't have to worry about him as well. She sent him to his room and said that they would deal with all of this when his father got home, which was typical of the justice system around the Corrigan household. Wait till your father gets home. It was a very old and familiar refrain. In his bedroom, Daniel found a box of Graham's belongings that his mother had left for him. The last thing Daniel wanted to do right now was go through a box of painful memories. But his mother wanted him to choose a few keepsakes and considering the amount of trouble he was already in, he thought it was wise not to push his luck. As the day gave way to night, Daniel opened up one of Graham's old scrapbooks. While he idly flipped the pages, dark thoughts took over and he found himself wondering if Rohan or Molly would be receiving a visit from the shroud tonight. Or would it... it, it visit Daniel instead. What would Eric do to him now that there was no more need for secrecy? Daniel came across a page of old newspaper clippings, yellowed with age. The headline of one in particular caught his attention. Meteor shower expected to follow recent comet sighting. Families plan comet watching parties dated October 12, 1934. It was practically ancient. Next to the article was a child's drawing. Its colors were faded and the paper was wrinkled and torn, but Daniel could still make out the picture clearly enough. A girl standing next to a building on fire, stars falling out of the sky around her. It was not the drawing of a happy child. There was a knock at his bedroom door, Daniel's. Daniel, said his father, opening the door. He hadn't waited for an invitation. His father wasn't alone. There was a thick necked police officer with him. Neither of them looked at all pleased. Daniel, this is Sheriff Simmons. 
and he'd like to talk to you, son. The tone of his father's voice set Daniel immediately on edge. He had expected his father to be serious, but there was something more going on here. There was something new in his father's eyes. Was it fear? Hello, Daniel, said Sheriff Simmons. You mind if I sit? Daniel gestured to the desk chair and the officer lowered himself gingerly onto the seat. Sheriff Simmons was not a small man and the chair protested under his weight. Daniel's father remained standing in the doorway. So I hear you had a little run-in today with a couple of my deputies. Daniel nodded. I hope they didn't scare you too much, but you know you can't be going into people's homes without their permission, even the homes of friends. You understand that, right? Daniel nodded again. Answer the man, Daniel, said his father. Yeah, I mean, I mean, yes, sir. And you also understand that we'd be curious as to why you do a thing like that. Why would you go to your friend's room when he wasn't there? I told your deputies we were going to surprise Eric when he got home. We were just fooling around, is all. Daniel saw the sheriff glance over to Daniel's father and noticed the deep lines of worry creasing his father's brow. Daniel's mouth had gone dry. What's, what's going on? Well, that's the thing, isn't it? Said Sheriff Simmons. We were hoping that you might be able to answer that question for us. You see, your friend Eric didn't show up for dinner this evening. And well, after we, what went on this afternoon, his mother is understandably concerned. He, he probably just lost track of time. I haven't seen him though. Uh-huh, said Sheriff Simmons. And how about your friend, Molly Lee? That was her bike that we found with you two, wasn't it? Molly? She's gone missing too. She missed her afternoon piano lesson and her parents expected her home hours ago. Any idea of where she might be? No? Maybe she's with your friend, Eric. Is that possible? I Yes, it's possible. Enough, Daniel, snapped his father. Daniel had rarely heard his father raise his voice, but now his face was red with anger. This is not a game. Those parents are worried sick, and if you know anything about what's going on, you better tell us right now. I don't know where they are, Daniel replied. I don't. Sheriff Simmons gave Daniel a hard, long look. You know what, Daniel? I believe you. But I also believe that you're not saying everything that there is to say. I'm on my way to Rohan Palmer's house next, said the sheriff standing. But don't be surprised if I stop back for another visit before this night is through. His father looked meaningfully at Daniel as he shut the door and said, We'll talk later. Until then, you are not to leave this room. And just like that, he was home alone again. Eric was missing, Molly was missing, the police were searching for both of them, and apparently he and Rohan were the prime suspects. Well, he doubted that they were actually suspects, but the cops could tell that they were hiding something. Where th they ever? Well, Mr. Sheriff, actually Molly, could be anywhere since she could fly, and Eric doubles as a power-stealing supervillain, and so the chances of it are that you find her, he won't be far off. Glad I could help. It was all just happening too fast. He wanted to be doing something, to be helping Molly or trying to stop Eric, but the problem was he couldn't leave his room. Not only that, but he didn't really know where Molly was or if she was even in danger. For all he knew, she might just be flying above their heads, letting off steam. Something else was bothering him too. Something that he had been thinking about just before the interruption. He had been looking at Graham's old scrapbook when a photo in there caught his eye. Daniel picked up the hefty book again and hauled it over to his desk. Under the light of his desk lamp, he could just make out enough detail in the rest of the faded old clippings to make reading them worthwhile. The book was oversized and a little unwieldy with a cracked binding and a dusty cellophane sheets protecting every page. As he thumbed through, Daniel's attention was drawn to the first to a photo of what could have only been Graham as a little girl. 
She was wearing her Sunday best, standing between a kindly looking couple, and there was a certificate attached to it. Brown and faded with age, it read, the great state of Pennsylvania hereby acknowledges the adoption of Eileen Stewart, age 10, by Mr. and Mrs. Herbert Lewis. Graham was adopted? This was a startling fact, one that Daniel was shocked he hadn't known before. But even more shocking was the newspaper clipping next to it. The article was dated October 14th, 1934, just a few days after the strange comet had been seen in the skies over Noble Green. The headline read, Local Trapper Leads Miraculous Survivors of St. Albans Fire to Safety. There was a photograph accompanying the article, a photograph that Daniel had seen before, hanging on the wall in the Mount Noble Observatory. But the photograph was hazy and the newsprint dim with age, Daniel could still pick out the haunted eyes of the orphans at St. Albans. Nine children with their faces covered in soot. Standing in the middle was the trapper, Jonathan Noble. Daniel tried to study Johnny's picture in detail, but the photo was too old to glean much. This Johnny was bearded and even dirtier than the children that he'd rescued. Still, there was something familiar about his face the tilt of his head. Below the picture was a caption, which Daniel read with interest. It was a listing of all the surviving orphans. Daniel used his finger to scan the name, squinting to read each faded letter. There she was, standing just to the right of Jonathan Noble, was little Eileen Stewart. It was remarkable to think that Graham had been an orphan, but to know that she had survived the St. Albans fire was almost too much to take in. Daniel supposed he could understand why she wouldn't want to talk about that period of her life, but he still felt a little hurt that he hadn't known until now. Daniel was just about to turn the page when something in the face of one of the other children made him pause. It was a little boy, smaller and scrawnier than the rest and his eyes stared at the camera with an intensity that Daniel found alarming. Whereas the other children looked mostly exhausted or frightened, this little boy wore a strange, angry scowl. Daniel went back to the list of the names. Will Notton, Miley, Herman. No, whispered Daniel, no, but it was. Daniel knew those eyes. He knew that look. Herman Plunkett, aged nine, was looking up from the page and scowling at him. He was reaching across time to scowl at the foolish gullible boy who fancied himself a detective. Just then something moved outside his open window. The blind stirred in the breeze before exploding. Daniel just managed to duck out of the way as the shape came hurtling through the window. Pieces of plastic flew everywhere as the blinds came tearing down on Daniel's head. The shroud. But it wasn't the shroud. It was a girl. A girl who had landed in his bed, who was covered in scratches and cuts. Her normally dirty clothes were even more filthy and torn. Molly, hey, she whispered weakly, new kid. She looked as though she'd flown through a wall. You're hurt, he said. I'll go get my dad. No, 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 I'm fine. I just need to catch my breath. Daniel started to go anyway, but she grabbed hold of his wrist and wouldn't let go. You were wrong, Daniel, she said between breaths. About Eric, you were wrong. Molly, what happened? He asked, coming back to her side. Now that he got a good look at her, she didn't appear to be seriously hurt. She was, however, a mess. Molly was talking, but Daniel couldn't understand what she was saying. She was in hyper mode and her mouth moved so fast that it was little more than a blur to Daniel's eyes. Molly, Molly, slow down. I can't understand you. Here, here, drink this, he said, handing her a bottle from his bedside table. It'll help. Molly took it and sucked down its contents gratefully. Ugh, she sputtered, catching her breath. I hate apple juice. Yeah, well, it's wet. Molly, slowly now. What's going on? She sat upright and rubbed at the dirt and the grit in her eyes. She already seemed more herself, but Daniel noticed that she was keeping a wary eye on the window. I, I, 
I was with Eric. I kind of figured. I, I, I know Daniel, but I needed to see him. I needed to hear the truth from him. Daniel started to scold her. He almost opened his mouth to tell her how incredibly stupid she was, how she put herself in danger and caused everyone a lot of worry. But then he saw the look in her eyes. And for the first time, he wondered, were Molly's feelings toward Eric more than friendly? He knew that Eric was important to her, but now he began to wonder just how important. Go on, Daniel said. Well, I found him there at the fort, and I told him everything. I had it planned to. I planned on weaseling the truth out of him, just like they do in the movies. But once I started talking, it all just kind of burst. I told him about Simon, about the quarry, about Plunkett, and of course about the comics you found in his room. And what did he say? He denied everything. I honestly didn't know what to believe because Daniel, you should have seen the look on his face. It was like I had hurt him real, real bad. Molly sank back down onto Daniel's bed now. And when she next spoke, her voice was softer. Then he went kind of crazy, I, I think. He kept going on and on about the real Johnny Noble and how he would know what to do. Then he just left. He flew out without a word. And you followed him? Well, duh, I wanted to see where he was going, even though by that point, I had a pretty good idea. The quarry? Yeah, he got there just as the sun was going down. Just one of these days, I'd like to see that place in broad daylight. I bet it's not half as scary then. I was behind him, and I stayed far enough back that he wouldn't see. And I watched as he went into that tunnel. And, and, what? The shroud. The shroud was waiting for us. I was hiding near the entrance, then all of a sudden it was there on top of me. And I couldn't breathe. The shroud? But you said Eric went into the tunnel. That's my point, Daniel. We were wrong about him. We were so wrong. Okay, okay. But if the shroud caught you, how did you get away? Eric, it was Eric. He came out of the tunnel like a thunderbolt and he started fighting Daniel. He was really fighting it. I've never seen anything like it. They tore up the whole quarry. Rocks and dirt were flying everywhere. I thought that Eric was going to win. I really did. But the shroud was just too strong. Then the shroud saw me and I, I, I flew away. I left Eric there and I escaped like a coward. But Eric is still alive. He was unconscious when I left him, but he was still alive. We have to go. We have to help him. Daniel took a deep breath. He stood up and went over to the desk where Graham's scrapbook was lying open. The picture of little Herman Plunkett stared back at him from that faded photograph. You're not a coward, Molly. You couldn't beat him alone. The shroud wanted you to see that Eric was still alive. He wanted you to go get help. He's taunting us. Without Eric, we have no chance of beating him. But he knows that we will try. He's using Eric as bait so that he can end it all tonight. Daniel, said Molly. If Eric's not the shroud, then the photo Plunkett gave you was a fake. It was a lie, just like everything else he's been telling me. And I fell for it. It's Plunkett. He is the shroud, and he has been all along. Daniel looked out the window at the stars emerging in an early night sky. His parents would be coming up here to check on him at any minute now. The entire Noble Screen Sheriff Department was out searching for Eric while he was caught in a life or death struggle with a true villain, a twisted old man who had manipulated Daniel and preyed upon the children of Noble Screen for who knew how many years. Come on, Daniel said, stepping to the window. Are you strong enough to walk? Molly nodded, but her eyes were worried. Are we, are, are we going to the quarry? Yes, we'll pick up Rohan and the others along the way. Plunkett wants a fight, then he'll get one. But what do we do when we get there? You said yourself that you're not strong enough to beat the shroud. No, but I know someone who is, Daniel said. 
his jaw tight with determination. A plan was forming in his head, and an outrageous plan that only a fool would try. So, he said, a smile forming on his lips, feel like taking a trip to the junkyard? And that will conclude today's reading of chapters 18 and 19 here in Powerless by Matthew Cody. As a reminder, your activity for this is to draw a scene from the story and to write a short paragraph summary of what happened over to those two chapters. Thank you for tuning in, watching this. Stay awesome. I'll talk to you later.